All right, so um, the topic of my presentation is material-based dynamic increase factor models for UHPC under compression intention. So what this means, the long title. So I will talk about dynamic increase factors. So this is like when you test something uh, under dynamic load, it changes the behavior. For example, here stress with a strain relationship. Um, it has a different behavior under dynamic loading. Models means if you like choose like one of those points, um, you don't see that, let me uh, click the pointer here, laser pointer. If you choose like points in the strength here, then you can relate this to the strain. So this DIF point, uh, this DIF factor into the strain rate, and then you can plot like a model to this. Uh, material based means, well, is this model what you have here based on experimental test? Is this truly representing the material behavior or not? And then, of course, we talked about compression and we will talk about compression tension. So is there a difference between those DIFs and dependency of the strain rate between compression behavior and tensile behavior? All right, so why do we do this material based DIF? Um, so in summary is to avoid making a fundamental mistake when assigning material properties to FEM or to FEM, I find element analysis or methods. Because if you do so, then you would potentially then um, overestimate the strength of UHPC and this could then lead to unexpected failure. So let's uh, talk a little bit about a background. How to calculate dynamic impact factor. Let's say we take a compressive uh, cylinder here and you load it uh, top and bottom uh, experimentally and you get the stress strain relationship you see here under quasi static loads right so you I know, you take maybe a minute or so to load this right? then you can increase the loading speed you increase the strain rate and then your material response may be like this right? so you can take then if you look at the strength value at this point and divide this by the, the static point and you get like a dynamic impact factor which is larger than one and you can plot it in a dynamic impact factor over the strain rate where this is quasi static right 1.0 is the one the factor here and the higher the strain rate leads towards the impact loading and if you increase the strain rate then you can do this again and calculate a second EIF factor at a higher strain rate and you are here Right? And then at some point, if you have enough points, you can connect this somehow and then you can develop your model about this. Now, if we talk about uh, testing under higher strain rates, so usually you can use like load frames uh, based on hydraulics or electronics to increase the strain rate, but they are limited. Right? At some point, uh, you cannot uh, increase the strain rate any further or you cannot create ideal condition uh, to um, obtain the real stress strain behavior. So you look for other uh, test methods and, and this one, for example, here in this presentation we focus on is using the split Hopkins and pressure bar. And the specimen here is in the horizontal location. You see here the Hopkinson bar built at Yukon with a high-speed camera and then um, there's a, um, a gas chamber which releases a striker. A striker hits the bar here through the bar elastically. A stress wave travels through then it travels through the specimen, part of the wave is being reflected back, part of the wave is traveling through in the, in the second bar, and then it's being uh, reflected too. And then based on those strain uh, histories, you, you um, obtain in the, in the bar, and then um, in the first bar and the second bar, you can calculate then your stress strain response of the material. But this assumes that you have idea condition, and idea split topics and pressure bar condition means, and it's very challenging to achieve, that you have a unit axial stress conditions in the specimen, that you have force equilibrium at the load phases of the specimen. This means like one load phase is here and the other load phase is here. But under static loading, this is easily achieved, right? You apply the load and you know your load cell can measure what the, what the stress is of the load at those phases. Under high strain tests, if the, the stress wave is going through the specimen, now imagine as soon as the stress wave hits the specimen, this side is a very high stress, while this side is still at zero. Right? So at some point, the stress wave needs to move in within the specimen a couple of times to equilibrate this. Um, here under static loading, this happens, right? Like a million times, you don't even recognize this. Force equilibrium, very important, but also constant stress, uh, constant strain rate. So when you test this, you want that the whole specimen is under constant 
strain rate so that you can relate this correctly in this diagram. So those are ideal conditions. You can, with the experiment, come close to those. Of course, not exactly. But um, this is already the first challenging part. So if you read papers or some researchers doing this on high strain rate testing, often they do not prove that those conditions are being met um, or um, not closely enough. And so they can make well, people taking the material from those the, those information from those papers into an, a, a final element model might make already the first mistake. And what is the potential mistake you can do when the test conditions are not ideal? Oh, and by the way, if the test conditions are ideal, then you use those equations. You calculate your stress based on the strain in the bar, to calculate your strain based on the reflective strain in the bar, and calculate your strain rates. So if you assume you have ideal conditions, therefore you use those equations, but actually you do not have those, then you make a mistake. For example here, um, and this is the real curve, um, what you can calculate based on almost ideal split Hopkins bar conditions under uh, compression. You see stress versus strain, like, like uni exo compression tests, right? But under high strain rates, and this is, the curve you would calculate by using those equations, but you do not have ideal conditions. Now, the thing is, in reality, when you test the experiment, you don't know. You don't know because you don't know because this is the material behavior you get out of your test. What you do know are the strains, what you measure, the strains and the strains, and you calculate and you calculate this material behavior. So in a test, you have to test like more than this to prove that you have those ideal conditions. However, when you do a fine element analysis, this gives you the additional information that you can, if you have you know, implemented the right considerative model and the right uh, model, what we have here, then we can apply the same strike or the same stress wave as travels through, we use the same strains, values to calculate this, but at the same time, we can also read out the specimen behavior, right? We can read out the force and the stresses in the specimen and can plot this. If we would want this in the experiment, then we would need to put some load cells between the specimen and the striker bar to read out the load value. We cannot do this because then it would interfere with the stress traveling through the specimens. So, and this is like what it shows here in the final element analysis. This is the, um, the material here and the, the dashed line, what we have assigned to the specimen. And this one here, the solid line, is what we read out from the specimen and we can back calculate. So it, it proves if you, if you have ideal conditions, you get the right answer. Ideal conditions mean, for example, even for this final element uh, analysis, you need to shape the parts, you have a constant strain rate, you need to have a certain ratio of the specimen, you have also the force equilibrium. And if we do not have this, even like in a finite element analysis, we don't have part shaping, for example, we get like this one. So, and then you see here, you have a difference between the, the strength, right? So your DIF factor, you calculate, will be different right? from this curve versus this curve, and also your associated strain rate will be different. So it's very important when you do tests or when you screen the literature and take some test results and that you are sure that those ideal conditions have been met, close to it. So what is the reason that the dynamic impact factor is larger than one? So we have origins of the strain rate sensitivity. So how can we divide this up? So this is, for example, what we test in the lab and we get like a certain dynamic impact factor. Some of those, could be, I just mentioned this, to non-ideal test conditions. And you have to be careful about this. But this can be, be minimized. Um, the majority of this is the true material effect. So this is our goal, how, to, uh, how we can isolate this and can obtain this material behavior. And another part is the structural effect. Um, the true material effect, it's like based on the water free water viscosity, so the Stefan's effect, or the aggregate cleavage, I showed this in a, in a second, or the crack growth inertia. Those are contributions from the material explaining or let us understand why we have a true strain rate dependency of material. 
the structural effects, they also cause strain rate dependency. And those are due to friction and inertia. Inertia, for example, um, <clears throat> you have the, the cylinder in the horizontal way, right? You, you compress here. And if you compress the cylinder really fast or under static loading, you also know under static loading, it wants to expand, right? Same as rubber, you push and it's expanding in the lateral direction. If you do this fast, then there is in this lateral direction a certain inertia, right? The specimen wants to expand fast, but the weight of the specimen says, nope, I'm a little bit like, I, I wait a little bit, right? So the specimen or the material push it against kind of itself, its own gravity to be in um, kind of accelerated in the, in the radial direction. And this gives a type of confinement, an artificial confinement, like a structural confinement, which increases your dynamic impact. Factor. Friction is there when uh, you know this from static testing, <clears throat> the, 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 the contact between concrete and the steel plate because of the different elastic modi they want to expand but they can't right because there's contact and that's why we have the two to one cylinder ratio that we have like uni axle material in the middle but in the split hopkinson for the high strain rate testing those kind of like when the specimen wants to expand and it cannot like it depends on the friction here can lead to some confinement so how can we minimize this so experimentally, we can minimize inertia by using smaller specimens, but still, it's it's always there. Uh, we can apply grease to the load phases of the specimen and in the bar. Uh, this this works really well. So we can also like drop this down to zero. And um, in terms of the non-ideal test condition, how do you can overcome those so that you have close to those ideas? So the pulse shaping I mentioned. So either you have a shaped striker bar or like. Um, a different material and um, a disc in front of the, the bar to shape your parts. You can limit the strain rates, but at some point it's like, ah, that's how far I can test, or your specimen length. You have to do the specimen small. Okay, so let's go to the material effect. The gore here, um, if you visualize those, for example, the crack growth inertia, that you maybe um, can imagine, why would this, would this, uh, why would this material behave like in a in this fashion under high strain rates. And you see here, if you have a tensile load applied in this direction, so you kind of want to separate the material here and in UHPC, we have a lot of fibers here, different fibers, for example, straight or hooked, or, or no, this is a twisted fiber hooked or straight fiber. You cause some micro cracks in the matrix when they are pulling out, uh, depending on the type of fiber, how many around those. But each micro crack has a certain inertia where the crack can only open as quickly as you know the physics allowed the physics allowed us to this and if you say the material open now that quick and the material said now i can all, only open like that quick so then there's like a, a hesitation like a, like in, a strengthening of the material behind this this is what we call crack growth inertia effect and if you have a lot of cracks this effect might be a larger. And you see here, this is the accumulated crack opening here, and then we have also some micro cracks within the matrix. Before it accumulates to a real crack, we call this as a micro crack shielding there. So just to give you an idea that a lot of cracks in the material, especially if you have a lot of fibers, can lead to an effect of dynamic impact factor. So what is our methodology to distinguish between those, those two? So what we get from the experiment, from the experiment is the dynamic impact factor, E from the experiment. And we can subs, um, yeah, we can um, substitute the structural effect from this and then get the true material effect. Let's take a look at this one. Still compressive testing stress strain relationship. This curve here, the static one is you test under static conditions, let's say under this strain rate, quasi-static um, condition. Uh, you can also then um, validate your finite element model to like represent this behavior with a constitutive model that this exactly looks like this. And then you can take your model and apply a higher strain rate to this material. But you do not assign any dynamic impact or any strain rate sensitivity to the material. You say that no matter how the material, how quickly it's compressed, it still has the same strength and the same behavior. But then what you test with the final element model is this curve, A. So this is the same material being tested, no strain rate sensitivity applied, 
but you tested this on a higher strain rate. This is where it takes into account, for example, the, the structural effect, like the radial inertia effect. Then if you know that, and you test your material in the laboratory on the high strain rates, you get like this dynamic impact factor. Well, you can take the difference and you know this is now really applied to our material behavior. So this is the focus of the research. So how big is this effect? And it's definitely there. Um, and then the outcome would be providing some models so that you can use this true material dynamic impact factor model from which we see then in finite elements. If you use this dynamic impact factor directly in the finite element, then the finite element will account for this increase twice. Right, because you put it in the material and the final element does it by itself again, so you overestimate your material response. So that's like just what I want you to make aware of. Final element modeling. So what did we do? We just modeled a quarter of the split Hopkinson pressure bomb, just in terms of save time and because of the symmetry. You see here the, the striker bomb is like at the beginning, so it's accelerated. Um, against the incident part, this is all behaves elastically, and there's a part shaper here, a certain metal with a certain thickness and diameter to create like an almost ideal pulse. It travels through the incident bar, travels through here, and then it hits the specimen, and part of the wave travels through the transmitter bar, part of the wave is getting reflected. Uh, here we can specify the effect of friction if you want to, we have all this investigate between the specimen and the incident bar. If we grease the specimen here, the friction drops almost to zero and we, we could prove this. And we used Alice Diner to model the system here. Um, in terms of the specimen, we need now to define a 3D constitutive model for UHBC. You see the results here, you can take those already and can implement this. So this is based on a calibrated KCC model in Alastina. Um, it, you see here the shear surfaces of UHPC, these eight parameters, you see the damage function here and uh, equilibrium, equilibrium of state of UHPC. If you want to have more information about this, how we did this in those papers, you can see this. Now, Alastina provides in KCC model, which is, which is pretty good already, but you can only add or input one parameter in this, and this is the strength. And if you do this, and you plot down the stress versus strain curve, then you get, in a union axial fashion, you get this curve. And uh, the solid one here, or uh, the, the dotted one here and underneath the solid one is our, is our test result from, you know, from a static test. So you see here, clearly with this one parameter model, you, you cannot adjust, it's like as much as we can adjust adjust this model. So it doesn't represent really behavior. So we calibrated our uh, KCC model by ourselves, like based on all those parameters. But it's not only calibrated uh, based on a unit exo compression test, you saw it with the shear uh, planes and so on, it's calibrated on a 3D behavior. And uh, since we didn't have any data to validate this against uh, 3D performance of UHBC, like with confinement in different directions, we used, uh, based on the literature, in those two papers, they um, provided the stress-strain relationship of confined and unconfined concrete samples. So we used their models, this is those analytical models, and we plotted them in a stress-strain relationship. Here you see like static ones, like non-confined, and here with a 5 megapascal confinement around the cylinder here with 10 megapascal around the cylinder, 15 megapascal around the cylinder, and so on. And we used this model, no further calibration, but just tested this with uh, different confinements. And you see here um, how it follows those uh, analytical models. So then we were confident that this model uh, works um, for uniaxial and uh, multi axis stress state. And then we used this in our finite element model. And when you do this and you assign a material which is not strain rate sensitive, and right, you say to Alastina, no, nope, this is, does not you know, get stronger with higher strain rates. And then you run split Hopkinson bar tests under, or first on the static test, and then you increase the, the 
the velocity, and then thus you see the velocity increase of the striker, the increase of the strain rates. Then you see how the material, like when we use this to talk in simple equations, how it becomes stronger. Right? And uh, it is because of the structural effect, the inertia effect, like the concrete gets confined. And you see here, I mean, the various relatively, or it is what it is, the dynamic impact factor due to the structural effect or the inertia effect increases here, about to 7%, if the strain rate was this. So it increases further with the strain rate. Now let's look then at the compressive DFI, DIF models. If we take the, some test results from the literature, then you see here plotted the compressive DIF over the strain rates. And here there's like low and medium strain rates. And then there's like a transition strain rate of 60 per second when then things starts to change. And so those are all like um, results we found from the literature based on split Hopkinson bar and where we trusted those values um, based on experiments there. So they include some sort of structural effects already. Um, we had recently tested um, for the split Hopkinson bar in our lab and we like, were in, in, this, in this region, so it overlapped also with the uh, data collected here. Now, when we took the test results from RISGARD, for example, and we calculated with the procedure I just showed um, the structural effect, then we get those yellow points. So the DIF effect from those inertia based on the straight range. Those two references we found in the literature from Wang and Zhu, they already provided a calculation about the structural effect of specimens tested with the Hopkins partial bar. So this is isolated, the structural inertial effect. So their values are like coincide with our back calculated values too. So if you make a uh, line fitting, we can provide a relationship between the DIF due to inertial effect and the strain rate. By the way, this becomes only critical if we are in the second part. I go back one. If we are here beyond those 60, like in this part, before the structural effect is negligible. So now if we compare this and plot the data points from the experiments collected in the literature versus the data points from the structural effect, you can approximate those with those two lines, right, those two, you can then apply the equation here, then to come up with the DIF model for compression based on material only, and this is like this line here. So now when you know this and you would run then the next final element analysis and you would apply then the strain rate sensitivity to the material in your constitutive model, you should not use the relationship from the experimental data directly. Rather, you should take out your structural effect and then consider, like, for example, there's like one suggested uh, relationship here. And you see here the slope in terms of the strain rate right, of the material is smaller then it's from the experiment, right? So your strain rate enhancement of the material is actually significantly lower than what you measure in the experiment. This only applies to when you're in the second part. So the conclusion is, if you would take the experimental data, you for sure would make, uh, or you would overestimate the strength with increase of the strain rate. And this is then true for everything what you simulate. If you simulate a panel with a penetration impact or is being shot at, or if you have a blast load on the column and so on, right? And it, it becomes so complex, you only focus on the material, right? You put in and everything else you let the, uh, the software do. But you need, you get the right uh, assignment of the material, otherwise you will make a mistake. Um, the last slide uh, in terms of the tensor DF for UHPC. And here the structural effect is almost negligible because confinement in, in, in tension 
has no effect, almost no effect on the tensile strength. You might know this already. So if we then gather uh, plots, and here it's like over the whole uh, strain rate, the log um, x-axis, and here it's like just the, um, the regular strain rate uh, plotted here. Then you see, um, like we collected those data points, and you can then provide a relationship here. For example, this would be for the tension PRF factor um, based on the tensor strength. For example, right? You can do the same thing for the cracking strength or hardening slope. Or whatever, but we just have picked out like one value, the tensor strength here. And we have just recently published a paper in 22 where we have tested. Um, the split Hopkins and bar, we modified this in direct tensile tests. Um, and we have proven with the idea case of constant strain rate and load e and force equilibrium and um, uni axis stresses in the specimen. And our values, what we tested, they fell in this region, or here, if you plot it in a different way, we have fallen in this region. So it's, it's very close to the relationship approximated from all test results. Now, this leaves then out the last question, if you have paid attention or not, which compression or which DIF dynamic impact factor is larger? Is the compression DIF larger than the tensile DIF in UHPC? Or is the compression DIF smaller than the tension DIF? So in my class, for example, I would then have the student take out the clicker and they can click one or two, and I see. Um, so here, think about, and then here's the comparison. You see uh, the DIFs, the red, the tension, and green is the compression. So you see UHPC is more sensitive in terms of strain rates due to the tensile strength than in compression. If this, why you can ask, like one possible explanation could be that those crack growth inertia with the fibers, it's more um, intense in terms of the tensile be uh, behavior, right, when it leads to all those cracks then in compression. And with this, I want to thank you. Uh, I invite you if you have any questions, and I would thank the Schrubenberger Foundation, too, for making this research available. Thank you so much.